Well, good morning, everyone. So this morning, we're continuing in our series uh, in Matthew, and I found it interesting as Robin was praying, she was praying for uh, many different people who are experiencing grief this morning, and Jesus was not immune as the Son of God to experiencing grief. In fact, today's story begins with Jesus in a situation where I imagine he would have had immense grief within him. In Matthew chapter 14, the passage starts off with his cousin John the Baptist being beheaded by a tyrant king who didn't like that John had the audacity to speak truth to power. Now, imagine, if you will, what Jesus must have been feeling. His cousin, John, who had baptized him, who had blessed him, who had gone before him to prepare the ministry that Jesus would have, is killed He's passed away, but not just passed away, passed away in a horrific, tragic, unjust way. It's in this moment that the story that we're going to spend our focus on today starts. And I think it's important to note that Jesus grieved because The story that we're about to hear starts with Jesus, after he hears the news about John, getting on a boat with some close disciples to go to the other side of the lake. Now, here's something that's helpful to know about Galilee as we think about this. Okay, so Galilee was a very, very small area on one side of the lake. Very small. And like a few hundred square kilometers, like small. And in that were over 200 towns, it was estimated at that time. 200 towns. The smallest one, 15,000 people. So think about that. If Jesus wants to find a quiet space, probably not that easy on that side of the lake, right? Especially when he's been going around healing people, teaching in the crowds, like teaching people. All these crowds are gathering to hear him. Like Jesus at this point probably can't walk down any street in in a town there without being recognized. So he's grieving and he thinks, "I I need to get alone. I need to get somewhere where I can be quiet. So he says, can I go with you guys? Can we go on the boat and go to the other side of the lake. I just, I need some time. Now, the thing is, though, the crowds get wind of this, and they're like, oh, Jesus is going to the other side of the lake. Let's walk over there and meet him, right? We have people that need to be healed. We want to hear more of his teaching. His teaching's amazing. Let's go to the other side of the lake and meet him there. So I want you to imagine yourself in, put yourself in Jesus' shoes, right? You've just heard this story, you're feeling grieved in your spirit, and you get to the other side of the lake expecting to have some quiet, peaceful time with maybe a few close friends, and you get to the other side and you literally see thousands of people. Thousands of people, like, like think, be, be honest with yourself right? Think, how would you react if you were in that situation and you saw thousands of people when you just wanted to be alone and grieve what's happened to your cousin? Like, what would your response have been to the crowds? 
you know? Some of us might have been like, oh, not again, right? Or, or some of us might have been like, what's with you people? Can I not get one moment alone? Right? Some of us maybe just a bit of a resigned sigh. <sighs> right? We might have had different reactions. But what's Jesus' reaction? In John chapter 14, it says this. When Jesus, this is verse 14, when Jesus landed and saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Jesus' response to the great human need he saw in front of him was not, oh, come on, guys, I need a break. It was compassion. Now, there is an importance to grieving and to have that space for yourself. And we'll see what Jesus does in, for himself to take care of himself later on in the passage. But Jesus, when he sees people, especially vulnerable people, people in need, his response is compassion. He loves people, especially people in need, especially vulnerable people, especially people that maybe society doesn't think all that much of. Jesus' response to the need that he saw before him, to the human beings he saw before him, was compassion. In spite of his own plans and ideas being interrupted. So Jesus is healing their, the sick, and the crowd is there, and it's, it's starting to come towards evening. And his disciples are very practical people in this passage, right? They're very practical people. And they say, they say to him, uh, uh, so uh, Jesus, you know, here's the thing. This is a really remote place. This is a really remote place. Like, there's no 7-Eleven nearby. No, they didn't have those in those days, did they? Right? But there, there's, nothing, there's nothing around here. There's no village anywhere close to here. Like, we need to send these people away so they can get something to eat. Like, there are thousands of people, Jesus, and they're hungry. This isn't a good scene. Let's send them home. They can go get something to eat. The passage says, send them away and they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied to them, think about, now I want you to put your, we put ourselves in Jesus' shoes, now I want you to put yourself in the disciples' shoes. And Jesus says to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Now imagine you're the disciples and you see thousands of people in front of you and Jesus says, nah, they don't need to go away, guys. You give them something to eat. You're like, this isn't computing, Jesus. Like, but Jesus, Jesus is operating in a different mindset than the disciples, right? The disciples are operating from a, from a scarcity mentality. Uh, Jesus, we don't have enough. There's thousands of them. Jesus who is the creator of all things, knows that his father doesn't operate in this economy of scarcity that the disciples are thinking of. He operates in an economy of abundance. He's like, yeah, God's not limited by that. And Jesus, in that moment, he calls his disciples to do things that go beyond what they think is possible, right? Because what's their response? Their response is, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking five loaves of fish, or five loaves of bread, I mean, and two fish, is not going to feed thousands of people. 
And that's what the disciples were thinking as well. Like, Jesus, this is not possible. Look what we have. There's nowhere near that we could even go buy food. And how would we even have money to buy food for all these people? They're, they're just like thinking like, whoa, this is not possible. But here's the thing. Jesus in that time and Jesus today calls us to join him in things that we think go beyond what we think is possible. We think, ah, we can't do that. We don't have enough this. We don't have that. I'm not a very good speaker. You name the excuse. It's not possible. We can't do that. God, do you really want me to do that? And we see this theme all throughout Scripture, right? Another example, Jesus says to Moses, like, come and help me free my people from Egypt. And he's like, "Uh, here's the thing. I'm not really a very good speaker. Right? Like, we always think we're not enough or we don't have enough. But here's, here's the cool thing about what Jesus says to them next. He says, bring it to me. Bring it to me. Bring whatever you have, whatever little you have. Yeah, you only have five loaves and two fish. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Bring whatever little bit you have to offer and give it to me. This is the cool thing. Jesus calls us to join him in opportunities we don't always see at first. The disciples did not see the opportunity that was before them. They just saw a big crowd and no food and were like, no. But Jesus is like, there's an opportunity to do something incredible here, guys. And, and, and in our own lives, this happens too. God is like calling us to something. He's stirring something within us. He's calling us to something and we're like, whoa, that, that seems a little bit much. That might be a little bit big for me. Are you sure that you want me to do that? Are you sure that's possible? So what I want you to think about, like what might be the opportunities before you that you just don't recognize because you're operating in a mindset of scarcity. You, you're... You're, Andy Stanley says, you're howing the good idea right out the room, right? It's a great idea. It would, it would have incredible impact potentially, but you're like, but we don't have this and we don't have that and we couldn't do this. And what about that? So no, let's just not even try. Let's not imagine. Let's not dream. Let's not believe for more. Let's just how that idea right out the room so that we can be comfortable, In, in a different version of this story, Jesus actually asks the disciples, in a different one of the other Gospels, he actually asks them, um, what do you have before they say five loaves and two fish? And I think Jesus extends that same question to us today. What do you have? What do you have to offer? It could be resources, It could be money, it could be gifts, it could be talents, it could be abilities, it could be ideas, it could be any number of things. Jesus says, what do you have? And some of us, most of us maybe even think, well, not that much. I'm I'm nobody special and I don't have that much. Jesus says, what do you have? Just just take a a step of risk-taking obedience and and give it to me. And, And watch what I do. Here's the cool thing. After they bring him the loaves and the fish, this is what happens. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. 12. Interesting. How many key disciples or apostles did Jesus call? Anyone remember? 12. Each of them got to bring back a basket full of leftovers. How's that for an object lesson? The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So it's a crowd, and they, they 
only counted the men, and we won't get into all the reasons as to why. Women, you count. Children, you count. <laughs> right? Society in that, in that time, they, they didn't think so much of that. Often, when they were doing counts, they would only count the men. Okay? But, all that aside, so the crowd could have been like, 15,000, who knows, right? Like, it was huge. We're talking like, like, so last night was the Cougars game, and they're all like, it's a sellout. It's like almost 6,000 people. Yeah, this was like, like, like three CN centers full of people that Jesus fed with five loaves and two fish. Not bad. Like, think about that. Think about, like, like sometimes we read the stories, and we don't actually take the time to pause and go, Whoa. Like the authority, the power that Jesus had through the Holy Spirit to do these things. Wow, that's actually, that's actually incredible. See, Jesus, he invites us to offer what we have that he might multiply it for the sake of the kingdom. You might not think you have to offer. I want to tell you a story I want to tell you the story. So, years back, uh, my family and I, we lived in Campbell River, and we felt compelled to um, help start uh, this, to buy this property for this orphanage. There, there were 60 kids that were just, like, left on the doorstep of this man who was doing street ministry to street kids who were addicted to glue. And all of a sudden, somebody just left him with 60 kids on the doorstep of this rehabilitation center he had. And he's like, I don't know what to do. I don't have much. He's like, I have enough to rent a small two-bedroom apartment. 60 kids. Two-bedroom apartment. No beds, no anything. like. And we saw this, and we were like, when we were in Kenya visiting him, and we are like, this is not okay. And so we gave from our own resources. We called others to do likewise. But the coolest story in the whole thing, in the end, we ended up raising all the 60000 We were given a year to do it. We did it in 10 months. God provided. It was awesome. But the coolest story of all um, is we had Philip, the man who was kind of running this thing, come over and stay with us in Canada to do some fundraising for it. And he told a story at this church. And there was this young kid. And I mean young. Like, I think he was eight, like around then. So kids... God can use you too. Okay, hear me. God can use you too. He was eight. Okay? And I still get a little bit emotional when I tell this story, I guess. And he went home and he literally broke open his piggy bank and brought everything he had. I think it was like $8. It wasn't much. And he brought it and he gave it to us and he said, I'm going to tell all my friends and family that they need to give to the suit. And he did. And like, I don't even know, like there were hundreds that were raised because of what this kid did because people were so inspired. And then the story started being told in other churches and people in those churches were so inspired. And it turned into this big thing because a little boy who was eight gave $8. And it it ended up being a significant part of the fundraising. Because the little kid said, I don't have much. I just have this, but I want to be part of something bigger that God's doing. And he gave it. And it inspired others to to think generously too and be like, well, we could, if if he can give his little eight dollars, we could give this and we could give that. And next thing he knew, everything was there that was needed. I could tell many more stories like this of, of entering into situations where like, I was like, okay, God, I'm going for it. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have enough resources, but you say I'm supposed to do this, so let's do it. And I could tell you many stories of other people I know who it's the same. See, Jesus asked them, he asked the disciples to take a risk-taking step of obedience, right? Because for all the disciples in you, they're like, okay, we're giving them this these loaves and fish, and he's going to pray over it, and what if nothing happened? 
Like, did you ever think about that? Like, what if nothing happened? They're like going around. They're like, okay, Jesus, great. We felt 10 of these thousands of people. And, you know, people get hangry, right? Like, that's a thing. Like, now we have an angry crowd that just saw only a few people get food. Like, Jesus, what? Like, they took a risk here to trust Jesus. That he was, that if he said to do it, okay, Jesus, you're saying to do it, we'll do it. Maybe they still had their doubts even in that moment. Who knows? Scripture doesn't tell us. But, like, they took the risk. They said, okay, Jesus, if you say bring it, we're going to bring it. If you ask us to do it, we're going to do it. So, I want you to think about this and ponder this. Is there an opportunity that Jesus might be inviting you into? Is there something that's been kind of stirring in your heart, in your mind? And, Jesus, and you, you've, been, you've been howling that idea right out of your mind, right? And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. This is my spirit here. I know you have your doubts, but just just bring what you have and see what I do. Bring what I but you have and 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 see what I'm gonna do here. What do you have? What do you have that you can offer? That Jesus is saying, it's okay, just bring what you have. Right? Some of you, you've probably heard this story before of this boy, he's, and he's on the sea, and he's throwing starfish into the sea. And the guy comes and says to him, what are you doing that for? You'll never even put a dent in all the starfish that are on this beach. And the boy thinks about it for a second, bends down, picks up another starfish, and goes, Whoosh. it mattered to that one didn't it? Right? Like, we, we have to be thinking in this way. Yeah, we can't save the whole world. Yeah, we can't feed every hungry person. Yeah, we can't home, house every homeless person, whatever it might be. Yeah, we might not lead every person around us to say yes to Jesus. But we can do what Jesus asks of us We can bring what we have. We can offer all of us and all we have to Jesus and say, well, this is all I have, but Jesus, I'm going to give it to you and and see what you do with it. Because as we talked about the last time I spoke, calling's an invitation. Jesus didn't force them to take part in the miracle. Jesus gave them. And, And by the way, Jesus didn't need them to take part in the miracle. This is the crazy part, right? Like, I was stopping to think about this this week. Jesus was the creator of the wheat that was used to make the bread. Jesus was the creator of the fish. He could have just been like, hey guys, you guys aren't getting it. Snap, okay, here you go. Here's the fish and bread, done deal. He didn't need them to, but Jesus loves to have us participate in it to get to be a part of the kingdom stuff that he's doing. He loves for us to join him. He wasn't interested in making him. He does the same thing in the story of Lazarus, right? He asks them, hey guys, can you roll away the stone? He doesn't need them to roll away the stone. He created the stone. He could be like, hey stone, take a hike. The stone would move. But he wants us to be a part of it. He wants our own faith to grow. He wants us to get excited and to to feel the joy of being a part of something amazing that God has done. And we got to we got to play a piece of that. We got to be play a small role in that. Wow! Like what God did was awesome, and I got to be part. Amazing. He knows the joy that we experience in that. And he knows it's also contagious. Just like it was with that little boy giving that eight dollars, it's contagious. Oh, wow! That person gave, and, and this happened, and I want to—I want to be a part of that, and I want to do that. And he knows that it brings us together and it unifies us too when we all 
are willing to say, yeah, I'll do my part to, do, to be part of something that God's doing amid, amongst us. Calling's an invitation. Jesus isn't going to force you. If, you. if you withhold, that's your choice. You might miss out on being a part of what Jesus wants to do, but it's your choice. So will you say yes to the risk-taking step of obedience that Jesus is inviting you into? I don't know what that is in your life. I'm not, I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I don't know what that is. I'm not, I can't tell you what that is. But if you feel like something has been stirring in your mind, that God has been asking you to do something, and maybe it seems small, maybe it seems insignificant, do not despise the small beginnings of things. The small acts of obedience lead to other acts of obedience, lead to other acts of obedience, and God does incredible things when His people say, hey, Jesus, what I have, it may not be much, but I give it to you. The worship team is, is going to come, and they're going to join me, and they're going to play a song by a band called Down Here, and it's called Little Is Much, and I just want you to meditate on the words. The main premise of the song is, is this line, little is much when God's in it. Little is much when God's in it. We may not think it's much, but when we offer it to God, it can be something incredible for His kingdom. So listen to the song and just prayerfully consider, what is God asking of you this morning?
Church, I just invite you to continue reflecting on this word. Such a good one, and it's okay to ask God, what do you have for me? What are you inviting me into? So go into your week with that. Just a quick reminder as well, we have a quick congregational meeting happening this afternoon at 12.15, um, and it's a vote for Nolan Hansen as youth pastor. So if you are interested, just a reminder to come back at 12.15. It's right here. Thank you guys for being here. Go and have a great week.